The last embers of the day were fading fast as the sky over Triprup grew steadily blacker. Triprup was a major settlement on New Savannah, and while it had once owned a human name, it had been renamed by the planet's indigenous inhabitants, a sign of their increasing confidence and independence. The city's wide streets had a certain similarity with central Amsterdam on Earth, if Holland had been hilly and the city free from canals. Certainly the streets were broad enough to happily contain a waterway had it been required. The tall, close-packed buildings perhaps boasted more balconies than its Dutch twin, but otherwise the similarity in architecture was uncanny. It was in the middle of one of these spacious avenues that the TARDIS now materialised. The door swung open and through it stepped the Doctor and Romana, closely followed by K-9. The road they were now standing on had a slight incline, and the Time Lords were currently looking uphill towards a row of houses marking that end of the street. Closer inspection revealed that this was in fact a T-junction, with roads leading off to the right and the left, the Doctor and Romana being close enough to see a little way down each branch of the perpendicular boulevard. Triprup, New Savannah, the Doctor offered simply. New Savannah? Romana inquired. Home of the cat kind. Indeed. During their period of the early embrace of new technologies, it seems. I would say they have reached a level similar to that of, say, Earth around 1930, or thereabouts. Romana nodded. Yes, although the architecture has some unique features, there is clearly a lot of human influence here. Wasn't this world occupied under the new Earth expansion? The doctor inclined his head. By this period, the cat kind of rejected New Earth sovereignty, but had yet to acquire the technological clout to make their presence felt beyond the confines of their own world, at least not without the aid of others. Whether welcomed or not, I'm guessing. Unfortunately, in this somewhat piratical period in space and time, it was frequently the latter. That said, this period of New Savannah history was quite a positive, progressive and vibrant one. It does seem a little strange. The Doctor's voice had trailed off a little with this last observation, and Romana turned to regard him curiously. What's so strange? This looks like a thousand city streets at night on a thousand worlds. The Doctor shook his head. It's quiet. Too quiet. This is still evening, and the cat kind are a gregarious and lively people. The streets should be full of their kind, socialising and having fun, the workday behind them, and partying hours still ahead. No, this is very odd. The Doctor and Romana then caught sight of a lone figure scurrying towards the door of one of the houses in the street to their left. Suit and trilby-like hat did nothing to distract from the furry feline features of this individual. Indeed, the brim of the hat had slits for ears, a uniquely new savannah and adaptation of the design. I say, excuse me, the doctor shouted politely. His inquiry was cut short by the slamming of the door. The doctor tutted. Most unusual behaviour. This doesn't feel right at all. Romana now pointed to the wall of the house ahead of them. There were two or three fly posters slapped to that wall. Indeed, as they looked to the left and right of the houses ahead of them, they could see these simple flyers everywhere, and all shared the same design. At their centre was the black silhouette of what looked for all the world like a Norman cathedral, complete with tall spire. Over this image was a thick red ring, crossed by a diagonal bar of the same colour and thickness, a clear indication of prohibition. The only words on the poster were easy to understand, even if their motivation was utterly mysterious. It read, Do not look at the cathedral. The doctor cocked his head at the posters. Why on Gallifrey shouldn't we visit? He mused. I know it's not popular, but why actively warn against it? The cathedral does look very earth-like, even more so than the buildings here, Romano observed. I believe it's pronounced cathedral, the doctor said matter-of-factly. Romana gave the doctor a withering stare. Really, doctor? Is that the best you can do? The doctor frowned at Romana. No, really, that's how they pronounce it here, he said a little peevishly. Romana looked a little taken aback, but still pressed the point of her earlier observation. Okay. 
But why does the cathedral look so earthly? Ah, well, Romana, you see, the earlier phases of construction in Tripurup were conducted under New Earth supervision. One particularly zealous faction within the New Earth administration had insisted on the construction of this religious symbol in an effort to convert the natives to their point of view. Obviously, these days, with human influence decidedly on the wane, and a healthy assertion of all things cat kind, the cathedral has fallen into disuse, and indeed has begun to descend into a state of disrepair, windows and doors boarded up to prevent injury to the curious, or possibly looting. Not that there is anything of value left inside. The New Earth administration made sure to take all of that with them when they pulled out. I see. So where is it? Romana asked. Oh, down the hill, behind us, in the centre of the city. The doctor said casually, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Romana began to turn her head to look behind them. She found her progress halted by a pair of hands suddenly clamped to either side of her head from behind. She quickly realised they belonged to the doctor. Doctor, what are you doing? The doctor shuffled round so they could look at each other without getting any view down the street. Romana, have you forgotten why we're here? What brought us here? He asked incredulously. Romana tried to shake her head, then realised she could not with the doctor's hands still attached, and so gently removed them with her own. Of course not, doctor. We are here in pursuit of two helpful time travellers who appear to be offering aid throughout time and space. Albeit aid which seems hastily administered and somewhat inadequate. But aid nonetheless. Two time travellers who, incidentally, also appear to be the source of the shattering of our entire universe. The doctor spread his hands, tilting his head at Romana. And who, do you suppose, put up all the posters? Romana rolled her eyes. Yes, we probably shouldn't look at the cathedral. She agreed wearily. The doctor nodded curtly, then returned his attention to the row of buildings stretching to the right and left in front of them. Romana's eyes followed his. Most of the windows were either shuttered or heavily curtained, at least on those windows facing them. However, one or two windows on the upper floors of a couple of buildings showed some light spilling forth. In the nearest of these islands of illumination, figures could be seen. Cat kind as might be expected. They each appeared to be staring out forlornly towards the city centre. All the while they were scribbling into notebooks, barely glancing down at their work, so intent were they on whatever they were watching. Just then, there came a sickeningly wet and cracking thud, away to the right of the two Time Lords. Their eyes whipped round to see the crumpled body of a fallen cat kind lying head first in the street, a pool of blood slowly widening around his crumpled cranium. He was clearly quite dead. That is most unusual. They usually land on their feet, the doctor noted, frowning. For the second time, Romana turned to regard the doctor with a look of distaste, this time bordering on disgust. Oh, come on! Doctor! That's just not on! The doctor frowned at her again, with more than a little irritation. No, really, the cat kind do share that trait with their earthly doppelgangers at least. They will always find their feet if dropped from sufficient height. The doctor paused, pointing up at the attic room window above them. This is made easy to identify given the fluttering gas lamp illumination within. And by my estimation, that would be more than enough distance for any cat kind to self right. The doctor turned now to fully face Romana. There are only two possible explanations for this poor fellow's current state. Either he was dead before he fell, or he deliberately threw himself at the ground. Romana shuddered then pointed to the cobblestones near the body. Just to the right of the corpse lay a discarded notebook. Then she shifted to point at the cat kind's outstretched hand. Still clutched in its lifeless fingers, held secure in death, was a pen. I suspect he was alive when he fell. Something drove him to record whatever he was recording right up to the last. And this ultimately drove him to end it all. Romana offered grimly. The doctor nodded his agreement. Usually I'd be curious to read what he wrote, but right now I fear curiosity has a bad rap. Let's just get on with our analysis as quick as we can and move on. K-9? 
The doctor's final utterance was shouted over his shoulder in the direction of the TARDIS. There was an unusually long pause. Finally, they heard the dog's strange reply. Master! The doctor and Romana stared at each other in horrified realisation. Quick! We must retrace our steps! Don't look back! The doctor ordered. Together, the two Time Lords walked backwards towards where they knew the TARDIS lay. Never once did they allow their eyes to wander in the direction they were walking, for fear of catching sight of the brooding dark pile of the Cathedral. At last, the doctor caught sight of Canine's tail next to his own right calf. He reached down, feeling for Canine's body. Then he grasped it and forcibly turned the robot through 180 degrees. The doctor could feel Canine resisting, his motors whirring with a sickening, rising and falling pitch, but the resistance was half-hearted and feeble. Soon, Canine was pointing uphill in the same direction as Romana and the Doctor. Canine! Are you all right? What did you see? Canine's voice came back slowly, and as he responded it became ever more laboured and strained, slowing all the while. Master, it lies there so dark. The Watcher watches, sees, all, all endings. K-9 fell silent and motionless. Doctor! Poor K-9! Romana cried with concern. What did he see, and how can we help him? The doctor stared intensely at Romana. That which Dog was never meant to know. However, I think I can reset his brain, just the short-term memory, I mean, back to the point when we first left the TARDIS. With that, the doctor withdrew his sonic screwdriver and placed it directly against K-9's K-9's head. He gave K-9 a short burst, then returned the device to his pocket. All was silence. K-9's antennae began to spin furiously, his lights flashing wildly and seemingly at random. Master, master, there is a discontinuity in my internal chronometer. Now, now, K-9, the doctor said soothingly. Just sync up with the TARDIS' own timepiece and think no more about it. K-9 word for a moment. Affirmative, master. Excellent. Now, K-9, you know where the TARDIS is. Affirmative, master. As K-9 said this, he attempted to twist round in that direction. The doctor held him firmly, preventing this action. K-9, under no circumstances must you look downhill. If necessary, travel backwards if you must. Is that clear? Understood, Master. Good. Now, do you know the exact location of the nearest source event? Affirmative, Master. Five meters ahead of our current location. Then go scan it, and then return immediately to the TARDIS. Master? K-9 responded cheerily as he trundled forwards. And K-9! The doctor shouted at his rear. K-9 paused. Yes, master? Don't look back. K-9 continued the last few metres to his quarry, whilst the doctor and Romana walked gingerly backwards until they found the doors of the TARDIS. Then they went inside to wait. The TARDIS materialised on the side of a rough earth road which curved gently down towards a sizeable fishing port. The Doctor and Romana stepped from the TARDIS into an early autumn night. There was a slight nip in the air, but nothing too unpleasant. England, 1878, the Doctor said gravely. Are you sure, Doctor? Romana asked. Absolutely, that, he said, pointing down the hill is Weymouth. The gas lamps you can see on some of the main streets are an indication of the time period. Of course, the TARDIS own chronometer was the big giveaway. This last sentence was delivered with something of a teasing grin, to which Romana duly frowned. At that moment, K-9 trundled out to join them. The doctor turned to him and held up a warning finger. K-9, stay! 
Before you head out in search of our next target, we need to make you a little more inconspicuous. Affirmative, Master. Good, good. Now, K-9, keep your lights off for now, and make sure your scarf is well wrapped around you. With luck, in this dim light, you might just pass for a real dog. After all, we don't want your appearance upsetting the locals. Understood, Master. Romana now chose to move things along. Now that it's settled, K-9, do you know the location of the nearest source event? Affirmative, Mistress. Romana nodded with satisfaction. Excellent. She said slowly, before catching herself, realising she was sounding very much like the Doctor. Anyway, where is it, K-9? She continued. Just behind that sign, over there, Mistress, behind the woman with the stick. The woman with the stick? Romana repeated faintly with some confusion. Then she caught sight of the person in question, complete with cudgel. The woman was clothed in a long dress with many layers, and had in addition a blouse, cardigan, shawl, and headscarf. She also had a slight stoop, but the stick was not being used to aid her posture. It was quite definitely being held in a threatening manner. I suppose we should go over and say hello? Romana suggested. The doctor nodded his agreement, and so they took a few steps down the hill towards her. As they did so, she raised her weapon over her head with both hands and cried, Hey there! Go on with ye! Get away, you scurvy souls! With this, the doctor and Romana stopped dead in their tracks. At this distance, even in the poor light of the moon and stars, it was now possible to read the large billboard behind the belligerent lady. In high, wide black letters against a stark white background, it read, do not enter Weymouth at night. Do not stay in Weymouth past sunset. The Doctor and Romana each raised an eyebrow at each other. Then the Doctor turned to address the fearsome female. Old woman, have no fear. We mean you no harm. We are just curious about that sign you are guarding. May we approach? The Doctor then leaned his head over to K-9 and whispered, K-9, see if you can sneak round the back while we keep her talking. Make your scans and report back. Woof! K-9 whispered back. Old woman! Came the indignant reply from the unlikely guard. Old woman! I'm only thirty-five! It was difficult for the Time Lords to reconcile her appearance and croaking voice with this last statement. Well, the doctor said quietly to Romana, I never was very good at judging the age of humans by sight. Romana waggled her head noncommittally. Well, yes, but even so, 35? I mean, I knew times were tough in this era, but still. Then Romana shrugged and decided to deal with the hand they were dealt. Our apologies. She began. In this poor light, it was hard to tell who exactly we were addressing. But now I hear your voice and look more closely, your youth is evident to all. My name is Romana, by the way. What's yours? The woman frowned at Romana and the doctor a little suspiciously, but lowered her weapon to chest height. Annie, she said warily. Well, Annie, my friend here is the doctor. Would you mind if we came over and talked with you? Step a little closer, Annie told them. So I can get a better look at you both. As she said this, she picked up an oil lamp at her feet and raised it to head height. The doctor and Romana advanced a few paces. And he squinted at them, then nodded with satisfaction. Ah, it's all right. I'm sorry I was so rude, but it's clear enough now. You neither of you have the look. The doctor frowned. I'm sorry, the look? And he shook her head impatiently. Come on, you must know. How far have you come? The look, that Weymouth look. At that moment, the sounds of shuffling footsteps drifted from somewhere behind the Doctor and Romana. They both turned to look over their shoulders. A small group of about half a dozen men were approaching along the road, heading towards the town. There was something of an odd assortment of unlikely bedfellows. Two of them looked like fishermen, while one seemed to be a cleric of some sort. One more wore a tall top hat and looked for all the world like some banker out on a stroll in his Sunday best. 
The two remaining men looked more nondescript, possibly shopkeepers or clerks, in reasonably smart but modestly priced attire. As the group grew level with the Time Lords, hushed muttering broke out amongst them. It did not seem directed at either the Doctor or Romana, but instead the sign guarded by Annie. The men began to veer off the road a little, edging in the direction of the sign. Annie waved her cudgel menacingly. Hey! Well, let none of that! Get on with you! Back to your homes! Or whatever you spend your nights! The group looked startled and tottered unsteadily back to a course more in line with the road itself. Throughout this encounter, the Doctor and Romana had been studying this new group quite intently. Both had found something a little uncanny about these individuals, but were hard-pressed to say exactly what. As this party moved out of earshot, Romana leaned towards the Doctor. Doctor, did they strike you as a little... odd? The Doctor pursed his lips. Well, now that you mention it, did their mouths seem to stretch just a little too far around the sides of their faces? For a human, I mean. Romana nodded. Perhaps. And did you think their eyes perhaps a little too bulbous? On mess, I mean. I suppose it could be a family trait. The doctor rubbed his chin. If indeed they were related at all, and of that I'm not convinced. And their skin, did it seem a little clammy looking? Moist, perhaps? Romana frowned. Well, yes, sort of. Apart from the bits which looked oddly patterned or flaky. Eczema, possibly? Annie had been watching the two Time Lords and listening to their exchange with keen interest. Ah, you see it now. You know it well. That Weymouth look. The Doctor and Romana turned to her now. Let's say that we do, Romana said cautiously. But we still don't understand its significance, or indeed that of your sign. Or their apparent animosity towards it. The doctor chimed in. We would be most grateful if you could enlighten us. Annie cocked her head on one side, contemplating the two time travellers and their request. Finally, she laid the stick to rest against the sign and placed her hands upon her hips. You two remind me of someone my mother told me about, so it seems only right to tell you the tale, since much of this comes from her in any event. Of course, still more of this story is far, far older. The doctor noticed a fallen tree trunk nearby and gestured for the young woman to take the weight off her feet there. She gratefully accepted, while the doctor and Romana remained standing before her. Weymouth is cursed, she began bitterly. Has been for all the time I've lived, and my mother's time before me, and for countless generations before that. It all goes back to the fishermen, and the unholy deal they struck. So the legend goes anyway. In that time so long ago, the stars themselves looked different. There were still fish to be caught here, and men to catch them. But then came the ocean famine. The fish died or moved away. Whatever the reasons, the nets lay empty and the people starved. Then one day, a fisherman knelt, whipping in his boat. He saw the nets droning bare as the day they were made, the boat drifting unattended by this hapless soul. But then... Suddenly, he was no longer alone. One of the devils of the sea stood with him there in the boat. The devil told the fisherman he could teach him the secret of the sea, so that his nets would never again lie empty. The fisherman was overjoyed and overflowed with gratitude. It was then the devil told him there was a price. The fisherman would have to lie with the devil of the sea form an unholy union. And not just this fisherman, with this one devil. All the men of the fisherman's tribe, with many devils of the sea, at the assigned times of each year. 
still more condition were heaped upon the deal. At this same yearly communion, any offsprings from the previous year had to be taken in by the fishermen and raised among them as their own. Annie paused here for effect to allow the whole unsettling affair to sink in. And so, Weymouth's nets never lay empty. But the people began to pay the price. Any men left in Weymouth after dark on the day of communion would be forced to partake in the ritual. And those taken into Weymouth to live among us would live as normal at first. They'd marry our women, have children. But slowly, over time, their devil of the sea blood would shine through. Their minds would turn more and more towards the sea, just as their very bodies turned more and more towards their devilish ancestors. Any of us infected with this bloodline has their fate set. Romana looked horrified, the doctor thoughtful. But what of this sign? What of your vigil here? What do you hope to achieve? Romana asked, and he smiled as if at a pleasant memory. Ah, well, that comes down to my mother, and those two others I mentioned who visited her here and helped make her dreams a reality. Even helped me make this sign here. Who was your mother? What did she dream? The doctor asked. Oh, my mother was everything to me. Annie replied. And she was no one to anyone else. Just another fisherman's wife. But she had a dream to halt what was happening to our people here. Or at the very least to stop it spreading beyond our town. But she had no concrete plan until she met the two strangers who visited one evening. Oddly dressed is how she called them. That'd be like you too, I suppose. With these words, Annie nodded to the doctor and Romana, chuckling. They gave her the idea to make the sign. To prevent strangers from tiring too long in this place. To reduce fraternization between those with the look and folks from other towns and seas. They also told my mother the sign would need defending from those already affected by the curse and who would resent this interference. So my mother defended this sign. To us how to do the same so that one day I could take over from her. As one day my daughter will take over from me. Very valiant of you, Romana said encouragingly. But I can't imagine you'll need to hand over that duty any time soon as young as you are. Annie shook her head. Sooner than you might think, I fear. You don't understand how dangerous this folk are. The ever-present threat. But surely you could get some like-minded people to help you. Surely others could help you other than your daughter. Others must understand the danger. And he giggled a little at this. <laughs> None can understand the dangers as well as me. None can do this job as well as my family. No one can fight those with that Weymouth look as well as me and mine. Here she tore back her hair from her face and neck. The skin at her throat was scabby and lined, to such a degree it almost looked like some sort of gill. <laughs> For I am one of them. She laughed insanely as she made this announcement, tears of sadness rolling down her cheeks, cheeks looking older than their years. Annie was clearly fully aware of her fate and that of her family. The doctor noticed Canine appear around the side of the sign, and he gently tugged at Romana's arm, encouraging her to back away slowly with him, retreating in the direction of the TARDIS. As the distance between them and the laughing, sobbing, unfortunate woman increased, Romana quietly whispered to the doctor, Do you think the Silurians are somehow involved here? The doctor shook his head wearily. I fear if that was so, it would be a best-case scenario. No, I'm afraid something far darker and more sinister is at work here. Romana looked about to speak, 
when at that moment K-9 joined them at their feet. All three were now at the TARDIS doors. The doctor held up a finger to forestall Romana's words. And no, I do not think we should do something. Or rather, I think we should, but we cannot. The universe, remember? Romana looked downcast, but nodded her agreement. Together, the three companions re-entered the TARDIS. The TARDIS stood upon a narrow raised walkway, one of three leading to a sizable square city, itself raised above the level of what seemed a surrounding swamp. The Doctor and Brahmana stood with K-9 in front of the blue box, staring at that city. Well, partly at the city. The city was low and flat, built of a near-white stone and constructed in broad tiers, rising towards a large central plaza upon its highest level. At the centre of the plaza was a massive basalt column, rising up at least twice as high as the city itself. It was over twenty metres in diameter, and covered in strange script and imagery, both of which seemed to twist the eye and unsettle the stomach, uncanny and disturbing to the core. This weirdly decorated monolith dwarfed everything else in sight. Well, almost everything. One side of the city had no approach walkway. This side faced towards a large, wide lake, perhaps a kilometre distant. Between the lake and the city, very close to the city in fact, rose a terrifying and horrific vision. This thing from the swamp had a decidedly amphibian appearance, most obvious perhaps in the huge webbed and clawed hands it extended grasping towards the city. Its skin further solidified such speculation as to its natural habitat, being a mottled pea-green and covered in sizable warts. Finally, the face left one in no doubt that, in spite of the furious look upon it, this was a creature happiest both in and out of the water. There was a distinctly froggy aspect to that visage, although its wide mouth was far more fanged than one might expect in a creature from such a lineage. The twin crests adorning each side of its face behind its bulbous eyes were also a little extra. However, it had to be its vast size which most assuredly threw it into the extraordinary category in the frog world coupled with its presumably bipedal nature. This method of perambulation had to be presumed, since, much to its ire, it was stuck up to its waist in the swamp. As such, its size also had to be estimated, but if its proportions were roughly in keeping with most humanoid bipeds, the creature's height must almost rival that of the black monolith. And it was certainly in the direction of that monument which the creature now stretched and reached, its flailing hands falling perhaps an arm's length short of the city walls themselves. Obviously, this creature held the attention of the Doctor and Romana as much as the city itself. Well, that wasn't in the guidebook, the Doctor said, leaning towards Romana. Yes. Romana replied casually, leaning towards the Doctor. You would have thought Neil Nia Sentry would have made more of it. The doctor shrugged. Perhaps the Nosma thought it wasn't worth mentioning. Could it be that wandering monsters of gargantuan proportions are ten a penny in this world? Maybe. Romana conceded. Then again, as an I and A civilization on something of a backwater world, they don't really feature much in anyone's guide, do they? The doctor gave a wry smile. Well, we can't just while away the day chatting. We should probably get K-9 into the city and scanning without delay. Romana nodded. Yes, before the other shoe decides to drop. She said with a raised eyebrow. I suspect it's already hanging off, the doctor retorted, nodding towards the beast as they began their walk towards the city. K-9 trundled after them. As they approached the point where the walkway met the wall and joined the ramp leading to the higher levels, they saw a figure rushing down that same ramp to meet them. I have never actually seen a Nosma before. Romana whispered to the doctor as they both stopped to await the arrival of this new individual. The Nosna skidded to a halt before them and loomed impressively. At eight feet tall, this was clearly an easy feat for this very non-human being. From its tall trunk of a body sprang five tapering limbs. 
Three of these formed a tripod at its base, and were obviously its legs. The two upper limbs sprang from the top of its body and seemed to fulfil the function of arms. Just below these arms sat two jewel-like multifaceted eyes. These looked like fist-sized rubies and stood out starkly against the Nosna's scaly grey hide. Beneath these eyes gaped a narrow slit, presumably the creature's mouth. Just below the mouth was the waistband of what looked a little like very high-waisted three-legged shorts, or perhaps strapless dungarees. It was hard to give an exact Time Lord equivalent to this singular item of clothing. The only other objects of attire were three rubbery-looking caps on the end of its three legs, which must have served as this race's equivalent to shoes. The entity waved its arms at the Time Lords in an excited, pulsating movement. Dear strangers from beyond the sky, be welcome and enter the city of the Nosna in peace. The creature's voice was unexpectedly light, high and piping, holding an almost organ-like quality. Its voice was not the only surprising aspect of its greeting to strike the Time Lords. Romana leaned closer to the Doctor once again. They seem rather au fait with otherworldly travellers for an Iron Age backwater civilization. She said discreetly in hushed tones. Yes, the doctor agreed slowly with an annoyed frown. Then he addressed the Nosna. Let me guess, we are not the first bipeds to mysteriously appear to your people. Why, no, two beings very much like you came here quite recently. The doctor rolled his eyes. Of course they did. Could you show us where they appeared? The Nosna waved its arms in what the Time Laws surmised was agreement. Of course, their moving box appeared next to our sacred column, the one you see behind me. Right in the heart of your city. Of course they did, the doctor muttered to himself. Perhaps you could tell us your name? Romana interjected a little more politely. My name is Dreel Jinth. You may call me Jinth if you like. Thank you, Jinth, the doctor said hurriedly. Perhaps you could take us to admire your magnificent monolith, and as we travel you can tell us what your earlier visitors were doing here. Jinth nodded its arms forward in agreement. Certainly. Follow me. Together Jinth, the doctor, Romana and K-9 began the long trudge up the ramp in the direction of the black column. As they set out, the doctor leaned down to K-9. K-9. When we reach the site of the source event, complete your scans as quickly as possible. He whispered behind his hand. Affirmative, Master, K-9 whispered back. Jinth, this is just a wild stab in the dark, but did your visitor's arrival have anything to do with the giant creature attacking your city? Romana asked. Jinth stopped suddenly with a sharp, fluting intake of breath. Great Nogad! You speak of our god, Nogad. Romana and the doctor looked at one another. Your god? So, Nogad is not attacking the city? Romana asked. Oh no, Jinth said with surprise. Nogad seeks to join with the Black Column, and in the process destroy our city and people utterly. As foretold since time immemorial, so shall it be. A confused look of disgust crept onto the doctor's face. You seem remarkably unconcerned by this fate, he noted. It is as we have been taught for thousands of years, long before Nogad finally appeared in person to claim his right. Naturally, we embrace his coming and all that that entails when the time arrives. Hmm, Romana said thoughtfully. So how did your earlier visitors take this news? Jinth gave a high-pitched laugh. Why, they built the swamp. Romana and the doctor exchanged glances once again. Again, the doctor said, you seem perfectly fine with this action, improbable as it sounds, given it seems to have stalled your god and averted your accepted and welcomed fate. Delayed, not averted, Jinth corrected. I said we were perfectly ready to embrace our fate when the time arrives. 
I see, the doctor said. Well, perhaps you had better begin your story from the beginning, from when the two visitors arrived, or Nogad, whichever suits best. And while you talk, we can walk. The doctor gestured ahead towards the higher levels. Once more, the party got under way. We, the Nosna, only knew our Nogad through the depictions and writing upon the holy pillar and other sacred tomes, although he has been with us in spirit since the beginning of time. Jinth began. We had not seen him in the flesh, not until a year ago. A year ago? Romana asked. As recently as that? Jinth swayed forward again in his species version of nodding. Yes, not long ago at all. A lookout spotted his head just above the waterline, far out into the lake. Although it was unclear at first, we became certain that slowly, unhurriedly, Nogad was moving towards the city. That same day the two visitors arrived. A most fortuitous event, no doubt, the doctor muttered. Indeed, they asked us about the appearance of Nogad. Shared your surprise at our acceptance of our fate. They asked us if we had a definite day or time for this fate. When we explained that a precise time had never been specified, they then asked if we had any objection to postponing that time. We were surprised, had not even considered it a possibility. Eventually, we decided, after discussion with our visitors, that if Nogat had no set time, he could not object to any delays, since they must themselves be part of the great plan. And so, the visitors made the swamp. Romana raised an eyebrow. They made the swamp. How in Gallifrey did they manage that? How exactly is beyond our understanding, but I have a good enough overview of their plan. They brought crate after crate from inside their box, more than we thought could ever fit within. Those crates contained devices called explosives. With these they seeded the plains around our city, all the way to the shore of the lake, right to the water's edge. Then they set them off in a sequence, running from the lake to the city, around it, and then beyond. The lake slowly filled the broken ground, turning the plains to swampland, leaving our three thin walkways as the only means of leaving or entering the city. They really did make the swamp to save the state, the doctor grumbled, shaking his head. Verily, Jinth agreed. I must confess we were surprised when Nogad increased his speed through the lake towards the city significantly once the explosions began. Indeed, he made the shallows near shore that same day. Given we were only working to his great plan, it is indeed mysterious that he suddenly sped up his approach. But from that moment onwards, he was stuck in the swamp, slowly sinking as he moved, until you see him as he is today, buried up to his waist. At last they entered the high square which contained the monolith. K-9 immediately sped over to one very specific spot and began to chatter and whir frantically. The doctor and Romana stared up at the dark and foreboding statue. Then they turned their eyes downslope over the city to stare at the slowly flailing and enraged Nogad embedded in the swamp. They were not alone in this. The square had at least a hundred of the Nosna keeping a similar vigil. Hundreds more filled each tier below them, but only on each side nearest to their god, right down to the lowest level. Those there were forced to look up at Great Nogad. All the faces of the Nosna visible seemed remarkably calm. A strange cracking slap broke through the air. Nogad's hand had reached the wall. Now his other webbed and clawed appendage crashed home on that same barrier. The giant roared as he half pulled himself free from the mire. The doctor looked back over his shoulder towards K-9. K-9, could you speed things up a little? K-9 began to scuttle frantically back and forth over a small area of the floor, lights flashing wildly, antennae a blur. Affirmative, master, came his somewhat Doppler-shifted voice. Nogad's new raised position allowed his hands to reach further over the wall to crash down on the edge of the public space behind. They crushed half a dozen Nosna in the process. It was so sudden, so unmarked by those around them, that for a second the Doctor and Romana did not notice this tragedy. 
Then they saw the greasy yellow stains oozing out from under Nogad's fingers. Why don't they run? Romana asked in horror. Jinth looked at her curiously. Why would we run? He asked gently. It is our destiny. Nogad now clawed his way entirely free of the swamp. As his hands and feet thundered down inside the city, a large section of the outer wall collapsed back into the mire, some blocks thrown quite some distance by his scrabbling ascent. And as his feet found purchase inside the city, the first few screams could be heard, cut short sickeningly by their landing. Clearly, acceptance of their fate only overrode the innate desire for self-preservation so far. And in the final moments, when that animal part of their brains fully comprehended their fate, it found voice, too little, too late. Nogad now reared up on his hind legs and thundered through the near stationary crowd to grasp the walls of the next tier. He left a trail of bodies and yellow ichor in his wake. K-9! The doctor cried questioningly in the direction of the robot. K-9 suddenly zipped over to stand at his feet. All scans complete, Master, he reported primly. Good boy, the doctor praised. Then he turned to Jinth. I am sorry, Jinth, but we must take our leave now. He said sorrowfully. Jinth waved his arms in a pleasant, relaxed fashion. Of course, this is not your fate. The Doctor and Romana both looked at Jinth with a mixture of horror and guilt. There was yet another crash, accompanied by one or two screams. Nogad had reached the tier below them. Come with us, Romana said desperately. You don't have to stay. Jinth swayed his arms from side to side. No, no, I do. It is my fate. Now came a roar. Nogad's forehead and eyes rose above the level of the wall before them, staring directly at them with mindless malevolence. I think it's time for you to go, Jinth said softly. The doctor grabbed Romana by the arm, and together they ran back to the ramp, canine hot on their heels. Behind them, all they could hear was tumbling masonry and sickening squelches. The ground began to shake now as they hared down the ramp, passing the lower tiers as they ran. The doctor glanced back over his shoulder, searching for the source of the disturbance. Nogad had wrapped his arms around the lower portion of the black column, his legs pointing towards the doctor and his companion. These legs pumped slowly yet determinedly at the floor, and as they did so, huge blocks of stone were torn free. Nogad was climbing the column. As the two Time Lords and K-9 reached where the ramp met the walkway upon which the TARDIS was parked, some of these stone blocks began to land in the city and swamp around them, in some cases perilously close. Glancing back, it was clear Nogad had become more enthused and energetic in his attempts to scale the statue. As they began to run across the causeway towards the blue box, blocks fell all around them, one even bouncing off the walkway itself, mere feet from the Time Lords. This is all eerily familiar, the doctor shouted to Romana breathlessly. Romana shook her head, panting as she ran. Not to me, she replied. They dashed through the doors of the TARDIS and did not stop there. Together they ran down the steps to the main console, K-9 floating down behind them. All the while, the TARDIS shook and rolled with the repeated impacts outside. We have to get underway, the doctor shouted. Where? Romana responded equally loudly. Anywhere, the doctor cried, then threw the launch lever. The TARDIS began to wheeze and groan, yet all the while it shook and bucked as boulders crashed into the swamp and walkway around it. Finally, though, the effects of the collisions faded, and all that remained were the familiar notes of the engines. What coordinates did you set? Romana finally asked. The doctor shook his head. None. I just sent us on a cruise into space-time. Well, what we have left of it at any rate. Romana nodded her understanding and leaned back against the central console, sighing. Then she noticed K-9. K-9, could you please update the display with your new source event data? Affirmative, mistress. 
there was a moment of whirring and chattering. All new data assimilated. Shall I update the readout? Of course, canine. The doctor thundered authoritatively, even if his enthusiasm seemed a little forced just then. K-9 buzzed and flashed once more. Update completed, master, mistress. The doctor nodded. Come, Romana, let us see what we can see. Together, the Time Lords walked over to the appropriate screen. The fragments looked far more nibbled and distressed than before. Their own fragment had a multitude of black spots or absences, while once there had been points of light marking source events. Only two points of light remained. Any, many, miny, mo? Romana asked, cocking her head towards the doctor. Oh, no, no, Romana. I'm sure we can do better than that. Romana nodded, and together they peered more closely at the screen. Romana frowned. Does that spot look a little different to you? She asked. Hmm, I believe you may have something there the doctor agreed. He began his habitual dance of appearing to twiddle knobs and flip switches at random. Romana knew full well he was attempting to magnify the image and maintain focus, and left him to his game. Perfect! The doctor finally cried triumphantly. I never had a moment's doubt. Romana assured him, with the barest hint of sarcasm. Naturally. The doctor replied, apparently oblivious to any insincerity. It seems we have discovered an island, he continued. It appears to be a section of our fragment partially detached from the rest, the doctor explained. It is surrounded by, well, nothing. Our space-time seems to have already dissolved in a narrow region around this patch. However, there are still corridors of space-time connecting the source event region to the rest of our domain. It must make this quite an odd place, only accessible to the rest of our universe in specific periods of time, from specific locations in space. A most exclusive resort. Yes, I can see that. Romana agreed patiently. Of course, such restricted access is the merest triviality to those in possession of a time ship, such as ourselves. Romana nodded back at him. Oh, absolutely. The question is, is this the source event we want to visit? One which looks on the verge of collapse and dissolution? I mean, the other choice looks more normally embedded in our fragment of time and space. The doctor flashed her a mischievous grin. Well, you know what they say. You only live twelve times. Romana pursed her lips, but her eyes could not entirely hide the smile. Liar! she said as he threw the launch lever.